We have some of these potato crates that are from my great grandfather. They were made completely out of scrap and their primary purpose was for drying potatoes after they were harvested. So that's why there were gaps in between all of these things because the potatoes needed airflow so that they didn't rot. They would stack them in these, put them in a cool dark place, and the potatoes would keep for a long time. My wife and I grabbed a few of these out of my dad's barn years ago, put some shellac on them, and we've just been using them for bookshelves or nightstands or any number of things. And I wanna make some more. I've made some in the past and I've kind of used the same types of materials to try to make them look the same. Obviously they're not exactly the same, but these are made out of complete scrap. So it really doesn't matter uh, other than a few of the dimensions, but I'm gonna show you how I make these. And if you wanna make some, grab some scrap and get to it. You can see on this one, the back is actually one big solid piece. I don't know where that came from, but none of the others that we have uh, the back is solid. It's always slatted like this. So it's truly just scraps that they must have had on hand. One of the most difficult parts of working with scrap material is just kind of organizing it and seeing what you have to work with. I'm just laying these out and kind of getting a general idea of the sizes I need and then cutting them to rough length with my circular saw. If you're using any kind of reclaimed material, I recommend picking up a simple metal detector. This one can either beep at you or just vibrate, and you always wanna make sure to check it versus something you know is metal. Just run it along each of the boards and make sure there are no nails. Next up, I just took all of the pieces to the table saw and cut them to the final length. I've got all these side pieces that ended up being a little wide. Obviously, you see from the originals, there were some that were wide, some that were skinnier. But I just, I only have two pieces per side and I think it'll look funny to only have two slats like that. So I'm gonna rip these down the middle and that way I've got a few more boards to work with on each one. A little more table saw work here and I actually decided to remove the tongue and groove off of these boards. These were left over from a tray ceiling at our last house build. And you can see my little guy wanted to be out in the shop with me so he's over there doing his thing. These were just a hair too thin for me to be able to resaw them and get multiple boards, so I just used my planer. I had to call an audible here. When I got into some of these boards, look at all that sap. Like that is still just a piece of heart pine or something, and it's full of sap. You can smell in my shop, it's just everywhere, but this is actively sticky still. So I'm actually pulling a bunch of these that have that out and I'm gonna just use a two by four that I have to kind of make up for these that I'm losing, but there are quite a few that just have a ton of sap, and bye-bye. I cut the spare two by four pieces down to the size I needed them to be so I was not ripping more than I needed to, and then I went to the bandsaw so that I wouldn't lose so much of the board. Then there was just so much sanding. A lot of these were really filthy from just being in the barn for so many years, so I hit them really quickly with 120. So the name of the game in this project is just using up scraps and stuff that I have. I've got some stain. I'm going to color these a little bit to match a little more closely to these old ones that we have. But if you're doing this, leave them plain. Don't put a finish on them. Uh, you could actually use a torch and kind of torch them to get a toasty brown color. You could. Uh, use some dye. There are any number of things. Uh, just grab something in your shop and experiment with it. This medium brown was actually pretty dark brown and we didn't want them to be that dark. Luckily it was a water-based stain so we just added a little bit of water and we got kind of a light colored stain. The next morning I came out and one of them had just completely arced itself. I don't know what is going on with this board but it has some kind of tension in it. I did a little experiment because I've seen this online somewhere uh, that if you're hammering a nail in close to the edge of a board, as you know, it'll split that board or sometimes a screw will also. So usually pre-drill it. That's why I was pre-drilling all of these nails because I really didn't want any of them to split. Well, I've also seen that if you nip the end, the sharp end of that nail off or I ground it off on the sander, that it won't really split that. And the results were interesting. It did start to still develop a split and I'm really close to the edge, but 
it didn't do very much at all. Whereas when the point was still on the nail and I hammered it in, it split it completely. So it's just kind of an interesting experiment. I thought I'd pass it on. Maybe you have uh, something that you need to nail to the edge of the board, take the tip off of the nail. The beauty of these crates is there are only two dimensions, uh, one foot and then these longer pieces that are two feet long. So everything, the depth and the width is at one foot and then the length of the crates is at two feet. Line up here. If you want to build some of these simple storage crates, you can obviously use whatever dimensions you want. If you want to use the dimensions I have, I'll have a simple drawing slash plans for free on my website. I'll link to it below. Go pick them up and build some of these for yourself. These are just some tiny uh, little hot dipped nails that I've used in multiple things over the years. They work really well. One of my pieces must have had a thin spot because one of the nails went right through to the other side. Fixed it. Enough messing around. Let's get the rest of this crate put together. Okay, I messed up. And here's the perfect example of why it's so cool that the dimensions here and here are one foot on these pieces because it's not gonna matter. As you can see, this was my old sample. It's always in this orientation, basically so that these can be used as a handle. It's cutting my head off. Um, but I just started on the wrong one. So sometimes we stack these like this and basically make shelves with them and uh, they'll still look fine, but from the ends, you can see these are vertical and all of the others are horizontal. So, whoops, it's okay. I'm gonna keep going. I asked my wife, she doesn't care. She said she probably wouldn't have even noticed if I hadn't pointed it out. But for the others, I'm going to do them in the orientation of the old original. To explain a little bit of the simple way that these go together, you basically just build the two end caps out. Uh, by the time you start putting in multiple nails at different angles with these side pieces, it all comes together in a very solid way. Then all you do is stand up the two side pieces and start attaching the longer slats that are two feet long. You start with the two end ones and you work your way toward the middle. That way you can space them evenly, at least to where your eye sees them evenly. I am really big on traditions and I love nodding to things of the past. I really like that I'm able to recreate some of these that we can use at different places in our home and just think back to the time that they were used more practically and not just for decor. So we won't be storing potatoes in these like my grandfather did, but we use them for all kinds of other things. Also, if you're just using them for storage, no reason to stain them. That added a little bit to the process, but messing with nails and hammering all those in made this take way longer than it should have, but I wanted them to have that look. If you just used a nail gun or screwed them together, it would be just as strong and way faster.